I am here today at your invitation to talk about the news of the hurricane season having just crossed over its peak, which is on September 20th. I talked to a group the other day and I told them that uh, that old line about counting sheep in order to go to sleep at night uh, doesn't work for me, but counting the days left in the hurricane season does um, fill those voids when I am not able to doze off. And I have different counts. I count to the peak, I count down to the, to the, from the peak, and then to the end of November when, uh, when it officially ends. And I used to always uh, tell groups that actually I considered October 1 to be the end of the hurricane season because we would get cool spells that would come down and form a wall, so to speak, weather wall at least, to keep hurricanes at bay. Not so much anymore. They are uh, continuing into October. Uh, we had one last year, if you recall, that uh, threatened us and ended up in Biloxi. It was, as uh, Stephanie Grace recalled the other day, a shoo-shoo, Lanny. Uh, and uh, I was amazed, by the way, that no one knew what a shoo-shoo was. I grew up with shoo-shoes all, all over the place. And um, it took one of my neighbors from mid-city New Orleans, Errol Laborde, to, uh, to explain what a shoo-shoo was for those who were disbelieving. But that storm, thankfully, was a shoo-shoo and um, avoided creating even significant damage in Mississippi with its landfall. Not so good news happening in the Carolinas. Our friends up there uh, have experienced a landfall of a major hurricane that had diminished to a Category 1 uh, by the time it made landfall, but brought with it torrential rain, and uh, that continues as we speak. And that reminded me, actually, uh, a column I read yesterday in the uh, Picayune, a, a syndicated column, well, it was a column from the Washington Post on the op-ed page by three meteorologists, I believe. And they talked about the uh, fact that what we do in the way of uh, warning folks and advising them about approaching hurricanes uh, really can present a disservice to the public and how difficult it is to convey the real threat uh, to a local jurisdiction. Uh, we're all very familiar with and, and dependent on the, the uh, Weather Channel and they do a great job. Uh, but their placement for video, for, for visual purposes on the beach with hanging on to a pole and the wind blowing can give a false impression that that's their problem, not our problem. And um, we had that experience right here in Louisiana back in 2008. Uh, Hurricane Gustav came ashore just south of Homa, Louisiana. Homa had been blessed up until that time with Katrina going to its east and Rita going to its west and the center of the coast being pretty much unaffected by both of those catastrophic events. But, uh, but Gustav changed that. It came ashore in, in Homa, flooding uh, from, the, from the bayous in Terrebonne Parish, hundreds of homes there, and then came straight to Baton Rouge. And Baton Rouge had been blessed as well uh, with avoiding major hurricanes, both Katrina and Rita and others, for many years, back to Andrew in 1992, which really did the bulk of its damage which was about a half a billion dollars in insured losses right here in, in the Baton Rouge area. But Gustav broke off all those old aging tree limbs and, and sent them through uh, roofs in, in the Baton Rouge area. And then it continued up into central and then northeast Louisiana. Alexandria and Monroe saw hundreds of homes flooded with the two days of 10 inch plus rainfall that accompanied Gustav through its trip through Louisiana. And I make that point each year 
as I do my storm tour of the state, all of the eight metropolitan media markets, all of whom are most accommodating, making their viewers and readers available to me. And it's opportune because there's so much no notice and publicity about the next hurricane season beginning on June the 1st. And so I take advantage of that and carry my message relative to uh, being prepared and how to uh, deal with and survive hurricanes um, around the state. But um, I'll do that again here today because uh, with your invitation, I get a second chance to remind people of the danger and how to prepare and what to do in the way of preparation from an insurance point of view, but also from a uh, safety point of view. And that first message, of course, is heed any warnings, in particular from local officials on the ground with knowledge of the vulnerability of their city, parish, community, et cetera, and, and the best steps to take, whether it's to evacuate or to uh, stay in place in order to uh, survive successfully such events. And uh, uh, my first advice on the insurance level is to get with your professional. Use it as an opportunity to do an insurance checkup, as I say, with a focus on what coverage you have and what coverage you do not have. And I dare say that the majority of homeowners policy holders in our state are still, after uh, over a decade, after 2005, 13 years post Katrina, the fact that almost all homeowners policies now come with a name storm or hurricane or wind and hail, depending on the company, deductible. And the legislature in the aftermath of Katrina took the prudent step of adding to the deck page, that cover sheet with a summary of all your coverages, a additional line separate and apart from your multi-peril deductible if you have such a name storm, hurricane, or wind and hail deductible in bigger print and with the calculation done for you of what that deductible is. And even with that, I'm still convinced most folks are unaware that they have such a deductible. And for 30 plus, 20 plus 10, 40 percent of our homeowners policies, it's 5 percent. Not 5 percent of your damage, it's 5 percent of the insured value of your home. And that's typically about $200,000 in the state. 5 percent of that is $10,000 that you are required to come out of pocket for in order to repair your roof or whatever other damage you might have as a result of such a peril. That's a lot of money for most folks to come out of pocket for. I was at a meeting that uh, Lloyds of London sponsored and had the financial editor of, of uh, Bloomberg as their guest speaker. And he had just then done a column for uh, Bloomberg News about the fact that if most Ameri 40 percent of Americans, not most, but 40 percent of Americans had to come up with $400 next week to repair their vehicle. that have to go to a family member or a lender in order to get that $400. $10,000 results in a blue roof for a year or two in the aftermath of a major storm. And that comes as a complete shock to most of those folks who think they're fully covered uh, for such events. Number two, my second point, in addition to the insurance checkup and knowing what your coverage is and what it's not, is to access the National Flood Insurance Program, benefiting our state by far more than any other state in America. Since 1978, we in Louisiana have collected $19 billion from the National Flood Insurance Program, with claims paid in all 64 of our parishes. And in fact, every state in America has had claims paid during the, durate, the time of the National Flood Insurance Program. But second to us is Texas. And it was a distant second at $6 billion a year ago when Harvey brought their, their total collections from that program up to $15 billion today. Third and fourth are New York and New Jersey. 
six billion each. We used to be greater than the next three states combined in benefit from that program back to 1978. Harvey changed that, and Florida has now joined Sandy, uh, the two Sandy victim states, with seven billion dollars collected in the history of the program. And Florida always takes the opportunity at national meetings to remind me that historically and still today, they are a net payer into the program, not a net recipient from the program, as we are uh, more than any other state. But uh, that, po that program being so important, notwithstanding its importance and all of the lessons that we have had repeatedly telling us how important it is, and I call it the best insurance buy, although it's really not insurance, it's a FEMA program, that any property owner anywhere in our state can make, commercial as well as residential. And despite that fact, when Katrina hit in 2005, we had 380,000 flood insurance pro policies in place statewide. And by 2008, that number had gone to 500,000. But by 2016, when Baton Rouge and Lafayette areas flooded, we were back down to 450,000. We're back up now to 500,000. And hopefully, folks have learned that lesson. In the greater New Orleans area, they truly have. While our statewide average penetration for residential properties is 25%, in the metro New Orleans area, it's almost 50%. And that is as a result of the fact that we have had 100-year flooding events every five years for the past 30 or 40 years in the New Orleans area. So they have gotten the message and learned the importance of keeping flood insurance in place. And my third uh, bit of advice is take this opportunity when you're thinking about it. Take out your cell phone and walk through your house and just film all of your assets. Film your flat screen TV, whatever other electronic equipment you have, your carpeting, your, your uh, draperies, your artwork if you have any. All of that is invaluable when you have to file a claim. And it can be a flood claim or it can be a fire claim. You can have lost your entire uh, home with all of its contents in a fire that makes it very difficult to document how much you had there and what it looked like and what it was valued at before the catastrophic loss. So with, with, uh, with those things said, let me, uh, let me move on to um, the reauthorization of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. As you probably remember, it was extended uh, since its expiration last year seven times now. And uh, the most recent extension expires on November 1st. Uh, we went through this process five years ago when, uh, when for the first time since the program was created in 1968, after Hurricane Betsy came through New Orleans and flooded the Lower Ninth Ward just as Katrina did, and flood flooded Chalmette and St. Bernard Parish just as Katrina did. And private insurers almost across the board and universally said, no more. We're going to exclude flood from our coverage, like we exclude uh, acts of war from coverage in the property insurance market. Federal government stepped in and created a federal alternative, an additional program, national flood insurance program. Again, like they did after the attacks of 9-11, when they created TRIA, the Terrorism Risk Insurance uh, um, Act, that created reinsurance, federal reinsurance, for companies that would continue to write with coverage for acts of terrorism, commercial property insurance in America. Both of those programs in their original versions were done for five years and reauthorized every five years. The flood program, however, five years, six years ago, uh, expired and there could not be, for about a year, a compromise cobbled together to extend it for a long-term period of time. The fiscal hawks wanted to put the program on a pay-for-itself, go-forward basis. And the coastal states, and we were fortunate in that event because Sandy had brought the Northeast to our side of that issue. Those, the, we had always had the coastal states of 
Democrats and Republicans of the Gulf Coast and halfway up the Atlantic through the Carolinas. But with Sandy, we got the, the additional support, bipartisan support, from the New England states as well. And that put us in a position to fend off the most onerous of, of uh, pr proposals that would have put the program on a pay-for-itself basis. But even with their support, the compromise that was Bigot Waters, when it was finally passed, reauthorizing the program for five years, called for rate increases over a five-year period of time, that when we read that bill, Nancy Pelosi and the Affordable Care Act, uh, actually in that case, she was speaking the truth. Uh, I have seen many thousand-page bills go through legislative processes that really are dependent on staff and lobbyists and other interested groups to dig into and find out the details of. Well, that program, Bigot Waters, with the compromise to five years of, of uh, a glide path to actuarial rates, would have rendered tens of thousands of properties all over our state worthless overnight. And the hue and cry was immediate and loud. And the, the uh, group in New Orleans called GNO Inc. began trying to roll back those, those egregious, onerous rate increases. And I was, uh, I happened to be president of the NAIC that year and had a meeting. The president asked me to bring uh, some of my colleagues to the Oval Office to talk about his area of interest, the Affordable Care Act, and actually the first extension of non-qualified plans that us regulators were authorized to do. And um, at the end of that meeting, I took out a letter from GNO Inc., which had chambers of commerce, legislators, mayors, Congress people from Maine to Miami and around to Mexico and even elsewhere in America urging a rollback to, to less onerous rates. The difference being, in Bigot Waters, the cap on rate increases was 25% per year, not of what you were paying, but what of you should have been paying. And that was ruinous for tens of thousands of heretofore grandfathered properties. And the rollback that was ultimately signed into law put a cap, not a, a low cap or even a, a handout, but a 18% per year cap on increases for commercial and of, of, on residential flood policies, 25% on commercial. Paid for ostensibly, though not, by a $250 per commercial policy fee and a $50 per year uh, fee on residential policies nationwide. And that was us uh, uh, done in order to pay for the reduction in, in the cap that was originally part of the reauthorization called for by Bigot Waters. And uh, with, with storms in, in Texas and Florida since then, needless to say, it, it has not paid for it to the point where Congress had to write off 16 billion of the 28 billion dollar debt that the program had in order to start paying the losses from uh, Harvey and uh, uh, Irma last year. And, and uh, that was done and the program is up for reauthorization extended seven times, uh, as I said due to expire one more time. The fiscal hawks wanted one more bite at it before the new Congress takes office uh, so that they could have their say in this last effort to, uh, to put it on a pay for itself uh, course over a undetermined uh, period of time. Uh, let, me, let me move on to a couple of other areas of, of uh, insurance interest and then I'll, I'll save it for save some time for questions. High auto insurance rates. Biggest challenge uh, that we have in Louisiana has been that since I was chair of the House Insurance Committee. Uh, we did a study committee back then and uh, Governor Foster came with a, a concept called choice uh, no fault. It was unsuccessful. Uh, the fallback position ended up being a bill I carried called no pay no play 
and uh, included um, economic only UM. It did lower premiums, 10% um, for liability costs, which reduced the premium tax take to the state from one year to, a next, uh, to the next just by that, although premium taxes are collected on every premium paid uh, statewide. It was effective, but it's long gone, and rate increases are built upon that lower base from 1998 uh, up until now. And of late, rates have been spiking again. And it's interesting to look back 10 years. If you go back 10 years on the auto side, for the first five of those 10 years, auto rates statewide increased by 1% per year. That wasn't unique to us, it was a national experience. Competition was, was keeping a lid on those, on those uh, auto rate increases and states were in competition with each other uh, to attract business. For the last five, however, in our state and every other state, they have been spiking upward. And it began uh, uh, five years ago with about a 2.5% statewide rate increase. And then the next year, 4.5%, the next year, 6.5%, and for the last two, 8.5% per year statewide. And that is very burdensome to folks trying to, to uh, get themselves to work and their kids to school uh, across Louisiana. Uh, opposite experience on the homeowner side. Go back 10 years, for the first five of those 10, double digit per year increases in homeowners rates in the aftermath of Katrina and Rita. But for the last five, as a result of a stabilizing of our market, 28 new smaller regional carriers now competing with each other for the business left behind by the major national carriers that have exited our market. When Katrina hit, Allstate had 22% of our homeowners market, they have 11 today. State Farm had 32%, they have 28. Travelers had my policy and a lot of the rest of the state, they're down to I'm not sure where, but probably not in the top 10 any longer. That void has been more than filled by small regional carriers who when we flip from, from our insurer to another, uh, uh, my wife heard the savings we were gonna have on our policy going from 1,000 a month down to 400, and she said, that's great, Jim, but I never heard of that company. Are they any good? And I said, give me a break, that's what I do every day. I'm not going to buy a policy from a company I'm about to put out of business. And her reaction was, I guess not, but, um, but we, we saved for several years 600 a month and are still today 400 a month less than we would have paid five years ago for that previous policy. And that has happened all over the state and has resulted in that 1% per year increase in homeowners for five years. But on the auto side, what's driven our rates and every other state's rates up, no question about it, number one and 1A is distracted driving. Not only is it dri driving rates up, it's killing American motorists in record numbers. Number two is the recovering economy. Cheaper gas and the recovering economy results in more miles driven. More miles driven, more accidents, more accidents, more claims. And number three, again my wife, uh, I bought a new Sequoia uh, year before uh, last year. And a couple months ago, she was backing it out of our driveway to get her car out, and I was distracting her, cutting up with something on the, on the front lawn and she's looking at me and laughing and crunch goes the mirror on the driver's side on the pole in front of our house. $1,300 to replace that mirror with its cameras and warnings and flashes and arrows and all that. And I thanked her for not backing into the pole because if it were a bumper, it would have been three to $4,000 uh, to replace it with all the sophisticated equipment in it. So. The combination of those three, distracted driving, cheap gas, recovering economy, and, and cost of repairs have driven our rates in every other state upward for the past five years. Good news, I just approved State Farm taking a 5% rate reduction on their auto book statewide uh, for the first time in, in those five years. And uh, that's a third of our market. 
So I think the mid-year market-wide, statewide market increase is one half of the eight and a half percent ultimate that we had last year. It was two and a half percent at mid-year this year. So I think we've reached the peak and like those, uh, like the no pay, no play benefit was baked in in the 98 era, I think we now have the uh, distracted driving, those other factors baked into our insurance rates. It's not getting cheaper, but it's not getting more expensive uh, any longer. Interesting side fact, and then I'll, I'll stop unless you want to talk about the Affordable Care Act, and we'll do that if you ask about it. But uh, 19, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, 90% of 17 year olds had a driver's license. Today, it's 70%. And 20 years ago, 95% of 25-year-olds had a driver's license. Today, it's 75%. It is a true cultural change in our society. And it is driven by hordes of young millennials, I guess, moving to downtown areas. We see it here in Baton Rouge. It's happening in the warehouse district and other areas of New Orleans. It used to be unique to New York and congested urban air giant cities in America. It is happening all over America now. And they get, they, they get away from paying for a car, paying for insurance, paying for parking. They have a bike in their condo or their apartment. They have Uber on their phone. They have Whole Foods on one corner and a sports bar on the other. And they don't need the expense of buying and maintaining uh, an automobile. We used, when I was in the legislature, we used to try to tie getting a license with getting your GED or diploma to get kids to stay in school and, and get, get their, their high school education at a minimal. And um, no longer, it's, it's not an incentive. And I hear it when I tell that to groups. I get feedback all the time. My kid doesn't want to drive, you know. They, they, uh, they don't want a driver's license. So it's huge. It's, it's, it's not insignificant. Agents are seeing it, and they're very concerned about it. Uh, their, their future loss of business and autonomous vehicles are on the horizon with, with um, mom being able to program the, the vehicle to go pick up the kids at school and bring them home without her. And um, uh, they, they worry about that. And I tell them not to worry, because that loss of business is certainly coming but it will be more than replaced with cyber insurance. No question about it. So with all that said, uh, can I answer some questions? Yes, sir. Blue Cross, the, the next pair of major manufacturing choice in Louisiana, do you have any other carriers that are looking for the same thing? Uh, you, you're asking automobile? Blue Cross, major Oh, Blue Cross, Blue Cross. Ah, I didn't, I didn't go to. Um, health insurance, but I have good news. As of uh, a week ago, I announced that individual policies in Louisiana next year will be six and a half percent cheaper than this year. And that's over and above a six and a half percent inflation factor for health care cost. So that's really good news. We're one of 11 of the 50 states that are seeing decreases in health insurance costs year over year. Let me finish. But uh, that said, it's not enough. We've had 50 percent increases in the last two years in, individ in the individual market. And nationwide, 20 percent of the unsubsidized individual policies have gone uninsured or were able to get into large groups that we can't count. We, we don't know how many were able to get into a large group that, uh, that provided them continuous coverage. But what we think is huge numbers of folks, working class folks, a husband and a wife making too much money to qualify for a subsidy on the exchange are just going uninsured for themselves and their children. That's why I brought a bill in the last session to create a state-sponsored reinsurance program that would have allowed me to impose a fee, our proposal was a dollar and nine cents a month, on every insured life in the state 
We could have gotten a waiver and had a, a bill passed to authorize me to apply for it. The federal government was encouraging us to do this. Six states have done it so far. To, with that dollar and nine cents per month on every policy, including the half of health insured people in our state that I don't regulate, ERISA plans, large group plans, I would have been able to generate 20 million bucks a year which would have accessed a hundred million bucks a year from the federal government, not in new money. They would have simply taken the hundred million a year that they send to subsidized individuals premiums in Louisiana and sent it to our reinsurance program. It would have cost them nothing and it would have lowered premiums, Milliman said, by 15 and a half percent statewide for individual policies. With this six and a half, we'd have had 22% rate decrease this year. But I'll take six and a half. At least it's a step in the right direction. My question was about more companies. We have one company that is talking to us about coming into the, the health insurance market. And by comparison, it's, it's nothing compared to 28 new companies. But by comparison to my colleagues around America, we have been so blessed. We have two domestic health insurers. Blue here in, Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, and Vantage, a doctor-owned plan in northeast Louisiana, that through the crisis in the aftermath of the passage of Obamacare, they have stayed in the market in every zip code in our state. This year, on the exchange, well, the, ex the open enrollment closed last year, but for this year, half of the zip codes in America only had one plan. And at this time, a year ago, we had hundreds of zip codes across America that had no plans. Ultimately, they were able to get one in, in many of those, in every one of those. Every uh, zip code ended up having at least one choice, but we've had two for forever, throughout, throughout the time. So you don't have a choice we're trying, and, and, and we're available, and we're open, and some are expressing interest. Um, the problem is, the two that did offer on, on the exchange lost $136 million in the last two years in the individual market. Now, they made money, they made money last year, they lost $136 million the two years before that. So, and one of the aspects of the Affordable Care Act that doesn't get a lot of uh, talk is the MLR provision, the medical loss ratio provision. And what that says is, Health insurers doing business in the state, on the individual side, have to spend 85% of all the premiums they collect on providing health coverage, uh, health insurance coverage, and other things that qualify for health insurance coverage, as, as, as defined as health insurance coverage, such as gym dues. That's covered by many of the Medicare uh, uh, Advantage plans. It's covered. Uh, it's allowable under the MLR. And 80%, 85% uh, in, uh, in the individual market, 80% in the small group market. That puts a, a limit on profitability for companies. I think it's a big part of why we're seeing this 6.5% rate decrease this year. Because companies really don't want to have to refund overcharge pay premium collections to their policyholders. Costs a lot of money to allocate that and get it back. And number two, it doesn't look too good to send a check back to somebody and say, we overcharged you last year. Uh, it's, it's a difficult explanation to make. So it does have that positive effect. Yes, sir? I have a clarification and another question. Uh -huh. Comments about State Farm, you said they're cutting rates by 5%. Statewide on when private was, passenger. Okay, when it was announced, it it was two different filings, one earlier this year for 2% and one late, more recent for 3%. I combined the two uh, that went into effect September 1. Gotcha. All right. My question was uh -huh. the uh, Affordable Care Act. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know if you had a sense for what the effects on the Louisiana health market would be if Jeff Landry's lawsuit didn't go on the Affordable Care Act was successful. What's your question? Is the Landry lawsuit... Um, that uh, 20 states, I think, have joined in, attorneys general have joined in, uh, that suggest 
that the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional because the decision that upheld the Affordable Care Act uh, avoided the big issue that Mr. Landry and others are presenting, which is the Commerce Clause that basically says the federal government can't make you buy health insurance in that area. They got around that, the Supreme Court did, by saying that may or may not be the case. We're not going to render that decision, but it is a fact that they can tax if they see fit. And so the enforcement provision had been the tax penalty that you would have to pay if you didn't have a qualified health plan. That tax was repealed in the last budget reauthorization bill. And now that that's not there, the question is, is it still constitutional? And 20 states have, have challenged that. Uh, who knows? I have no idea what would happen. The, the, the health insurance market has been in chaos for the entire five years. Um, reinsurance was also part of the Affordable Care Act for three years, and it had a 14% diminishing of premium increases uh, effect uh, nationwide because it was anticipated that it would be chaotic when it was first rolled out. Guarantee issue, no lifetime limits, uh, qualified health plans only. All of those things are very disruptive in an insurance marketplace. Federal government funded and cr created and funded a reinsurance program of their own, but with a sunset of three years. And when it sunsetted, we saw 33% rate increase in the individual market in Louisiana, 18% the next year, and while that was being implemented, 136 million in losses for the two companies doing business in the individual market in our state. So I don't think anybody can predict what will happen if the whole thing, the whole law is thrown out. A lot of it has been watered down, if you will. Short-term policies are now being authorized for up to 36 months duration that don't meet the, the Affordable Care Act requirements. Association health plans, the version of writing across state lines that was promised in the Republican talking points is being implemented now on a very much, uh, not very much, but on a less limited and restricted basis than association health plans heretofore have, uh, have been regulated by in the individual states, ours included. So these things are already uh, diminishing the, uh, the Affordable Care Act's impact on the market. And uh, where that will, combined with a successful challenge, uh, leave us, I'm not sure. If it were up to me, and I've said this for five years now, wouldn't have voted in the first place. It was rushed out, half-baked was the term I used all the time. And that happened because um, Senator Kennedy died and the Republicans won that 60th vote. Uh, on the Senate side, which was uh, the, the filibuster proof required 60th vote. Um, and if it were up to me last year, I'd have voted for Graham Cassidy. And that would have, in effect, redirected the, the uh, regulation of insurance and the reforms and alternatives that should be put in place to the state level, where I think insurance is much better regulated. Okay, we only have time for one more question. So, so Jim, a follow-up to that. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Landry indicated that uh, pre-existing condition, which is very popular, and hundreds of thousands of people need it in Louisiana, what do you call that? Well, and, there, and what should the state have then if it has responsibility? No doubt about it. Uh, that is an important aspect, probably the most important aspect and core uh, to the program. But what we had before, and it worked very well with 2,200 insured lives in it, was called the Louisiana, Associate, uh, Louisiana Health Plan, our high risk pool. And we did that before, I don't think there were a dozen states that did it before we did, when, when I was back in the legislature. And actually, Kirk Talbot's dad, Doug Talbot, 
owner of Lucky Dogs, was the the create the the movement that uh, that made it happen in our state because he had a woman who bought a, he had a small group policy and one of his employees got cancer and that company we we don't regulate rates in the health in uh, world in Louisiana two dozen states don't and we don't uh, I've asked many times and I I don't get it but um, but they kept raising that small group at every renewal, 75, 100, 150% at a time to try and chase it off to get off the hook for heart cancer treatment. And uh, he came to the legislature and we uh, passed a bill to create our high risk pool. And so that is one option for doing that. States could, on their own, have guarantee issue in their individual state. So we, we could pass that in the legislature. And I dare say, it would be a popular bill if the Landry attack were successful and uh, the legislature had to decide what to do going forward. One of the other popular aspects of the Affordable Care Act is keeping your kids on your policy to age 26. I happen to have read that New York did that the same year that the Affordable Care Act was passed. And before that was passed, I had a bill introduced that went through the legislature unanimously virtually, I think, if I recall correctly, that did it on the state level. Became moot when the feds did it nationwide, but it's law in Louisiana if Landry is successful in having the Affordable Care Act thrown out. Well, when he commented on this, uh, that, uh, when he saw that, he didn't seem to have any plan or thought oh, no. about what would happen. So have they been consulting with you? He has not, and, and that's no knock on him because, frankly, uh, what I have found is the knowledge of health insurance on the federal level in Congress is less than the knowledge of health insurance on the state level in the legislature. And the more they learned about it, the less they liked it. It is not a popular issue to deal with. It is very complicated, very expensive, and, and very difficult to to fix. And uh, so I think um, the Attorney General would defer to someone like, we're, we're very, I, I will tell you, we are very blessed to have Bill Cassidy in our delegation. He is very knowledgeable, he's I think very sincere, and he is very hands-on in the process. He gets into the details and, and involves himself uh, in, in finding solutions. Oh,